from Kona to Yanan, The Political Memoirs of Koji Ariyoshi, Chapter 4, San Francisco Docks, 1941. In the summer of 1941, Japanese assets were frozen in this country. The embargo had already been slapped on shipment of strategic materials to Japan. We had been registered by the Selective Service, and special military training programs were going on at the universities. One day the Marine recruiters came to the University of Georgia at Athens. A friend persuaded me to enlist with him so that we could go to Quantico for officer training. I told him that the Marines would not take me because I was of Japanese extraction, but finally, to satisfy him that I was not backing down and serving my country, I went along with him and was rejected. He could not get over the fact that ancestry made such a difference. So I mentioned to him how ancestry and not merit was used to keep Negroes down in the South. The year in Georgia had passed rapidly. The world scene had changed drastically. England and Russia were fighting Germany and Italy, and our government had pledged all possible aid to the former. Soon after graduation I headed back for the West Coast, and in San Francisco I became a longshoreman. My life revolved around the union hiring hall, which provided equal job opportunities to all dock workers. The union dispatcher assigned us to work on ships and docks. We kept within our quota of hours, and if we exceeded our quota one week, we put in fewer hours the following week. The racketeering shape-up still used on the East Coast had been swept away during the 1934 longshore strike in San Francisco. There was no dog-eat-dog -dog competition among workers for jobs, only cooperation and unity. Working conditions were good. Unlike on Honolulu docks where I had worked, sling loads were not high and dangerous. The old men worked with the young at a steady pace, not at a killing pace such as had prevailed on Honolulu's waterfront. One night a grievance arose on the job, and the steward of our gang argued over working conditions with the foreman. The steward pulled out the contract agreement and he won, but toward dawn the foreman found a pretext and checked out the steward. This matter came up before the grievance committee for trial, and the steward had asked those of us who worked in the gang to be his witnesses. At the trial, I was the only witness present and he won. From that day, friendship developed between the steward and me. I recall going to his home to read books which were soiled and marked from constant use. He and his wife were strong, class-conscious individuals who had dedicated themselves to the struggles of the workers to improve their lot. We can't be merely working stiffs in the literal sense, he used to say. We get our practical education down on the waterfront, but we must read books and hold discussions to sharpen and broaden our thinking. I began reading volume after volume of books at my friend's home, at the public library, and my own copies which I bought at bookstores. In various left-wing books I began to find answers to the questions I had in mind for many years, and I wish that I had come across them earlier. One keeps moving and searching for more knowledge in such a passionate quest. At a gathering one evening I heard a woman lawyer from Oklahoma describe book burning in her hometown. She and her husband, also a lawyer, were imprisoned for running a progressive bookstore and she was out on bail, touring the country to gather support in the struggle against repression in Oklahoma. She told us how vigilantes and the police wrecked their store, threw the books into the street, and set them afire. Among them were copies of the U.S. Constitution, with cover flaps illustrated with the stars and stripes. This, I believe, was my first contact with political repression, besides the persecution of Harry Bridges. This woman lawyer spoke at a longshoreman's meeting. She had a responsive audience, for most of the longshoremen understood the reason for such sharp attacks against people who tried to raise the thinking of the working people. Harry Bridges was then fighting deportation, and we were fighting with him. He was our leader. The longshoremen remembered their animal-like treatment by the bosses before the 1934 strike. If Bridges had not remained loyal to his fellow workers, the government agencies would not have hounded him. I remember one night when Bridges walked into Eagles Hall where we longshoremen met. He had taken time out from his hearings to come back to the West Coast. As he climbed onto the stage, a couple thousand of his membership stood up and clapped their hands in ovation for 15 minutes. I was deeply agitated by this moving event, which left a lasting impression upon me. I looked around at my brother longshoremen. Most of them were immigrants, many had become naturalized. Almost all of them were old-timers who had gone through years of inhuman exploitation. The strike struggles, massacre and death at the hands of National Guardsmen, goons and strike breakers. They knew what they were fighting against when they rallied to defend Bridges. He was a symbol to them and to me. We were fighting for democratic rights to be enjoyed by the working class as they were enjoyed by the employers. Long ago, for example, under the British monarchy, the nobility enjoyed privileges which they, as the ruling class, denied to tradesmen, farmers and artisans. The rising class of businessmen won their rights through hard struggles. The workers still have theirs to win. And men like Bridges were, and are, giving capable leadership to the working class, refusing to be bought off by the bosses. I remember buying Bridges' defense stamps and carefully pasting them in my union membership book. 
These acts made me conscious more and more of my role as a worker, and as I saw the sharp struggles all around me, I saw why, by employer propagandists and even in the universities, the doctrine was spread that there is no such differentiation as a class or classes in human society, but that all people were alike and living in harmony. As more workers realize that they constitute a class, they become united to struggle harder to better their common lot. War came all of a sudden. I was on night shift at an army transport dock in San Francisco on the night of December 7, 1941, Pearl Harbor Day. During the morning I heard the news of the Japanese attack over the radio. One of the first thoughts that occurred to me on December 7th was about the status of people of Japanese ancestry in the United States in this new situation. Will we go on living as we are, making our contributions to the war effort as any other person, or will we be subjected to demands for proving our loyalty? During the decade prior to Pearl Harbor, Japanese Americans were criticized by the press in Hawaii and on the West Coast for not denouncing Japanese aggression in Manchuria and China proper strongly enough. There were some, however, who wanted expressions of loyalty in order to strengthen their defense of the Japanese Americans. Although the Japanese Americans took this country as their native land, and their parents regarded the United States as their adopted country, those white Americans who were prejudiced against us because of color questioned our loyalty the most. Racists who discriminated against any non-white were quick to question our loyalty. This was logical. Ironically, this is the behavior of people who feel they are the Americans and because they have not treated non-white people with decency and respect, they could not see how these people could love a country which they call their own. Here are people with a different concept of what America means. One thinks of it in terms of monopoly by a few, while the other believes in the extension of constitutional rights to all, still not obtained. In looking back, I see that my experiences of December 1941 and January, February and March of 1942, before the evacuation, were weird and are almost frightful even today. I remember being marched off the docks at Bayonet Point. Uniformed state guards also marched in front and beside me with drawn pistols. I remember the questionings by the FBI, Naval and Army Intelligence officers. I was judged on my ancestry and government agents practically ignored the fact that I, as well as others of Japanese extraction, were products of this country. Their behavior actually showed their contempt of education and other influences in this country that shaped the development of individuals. The hysteria created against those of us of Japanese ancestry was almost beyond description. I see similar aspects in the hysteria created today against political nonconformists. Yeah. On the evening of December 7th, I went through my bags to pick out my selective service card, citizenship certificate, seamen's papers and other identification. These I carried to work with me that night. Shortly after we commenced working there was a great deal of commotion on the dock, with army officers and enlisted men rushing around. We longshoremen commented that war had alerted everyone, particularly the military. Then, we all learned that I was the cause of the excitement. A man in army uniform grabbed my arm and took me to a major who was all flustered. The major was intensely infuriated and indignant at me because I did not realize what a serious situation I had created for him by being present on docks where military cargo was handled. But I am a citizen. I told him and took out my citizenship paper, birth certificate, and other identification. You can't work on the docks from now on. Don't ever come back here. Can't you see we are at war with Japan? I'm a longshoreman and a citizen. Even aliens have the right to work cargo on these docks, I said. The major told a sergeant to take me out of the docks. I pointed at my identification papers and the major shoved them toward me. He said they did not mean a thing to him. He was concerned about our country, he said. I said I was too, when citizenship was a scrap of paper without meaning to him. Finally the major said, come see me tomorrow at the Presidio. Here's my name and address. The following day I went to see him. The guard at the gate phoned him. The major could not see me, he was busy. No, not even tomorrow or the next day or the day after. I understood very clearly. Thereafter, the union dispatcher at the hiring hall sent me out to work on private docks which handled non-military cargo. Since army transport docks took only citizens, most of the longshoremen I worked with were aliens. Some were German and Italian, but they were against fascism and Nazism. Down on the waterfront, sentry boxes were everywhere. Even as I walked to work on the Embarcadero to my assigned dock, National Guard sentries halted me at short intervals. Often I was stopped more than ten times. The sentries examined my pass and when they saw my Japanese name they became excited. A few of them made telephone calls to their superiors. Everyone examined my lunch kit, and for each of them I took out my sandwiches and thermos bottle to show I concealed nothing. When some tried to stall me and I was afraid I would be late for work, I pulled out my citizenship papers. 
The sentries changed frequently, and this made it more difficult for me, as I had to go through the same ritual night after night. Some guards made it very unpleasant for me. They were young, inexperienced, and, I was afraid, trigger-happy. A few told me in no uncertain way that if they had their way, they would shoot me. I deeply felt the effect of the white supremacy and racist propaganda every time the sentries stopped me on the Embarcadero. German and Italian aliens were not stopped, and they did not have to take their sandwiches out to show that eggs or luncheon meat were between the slices of bread, and not dangerous weapons. One night as I started up the gangplank a guard told me to jump down and wait until everyone had gone on the ship. The gangplank was pretty crowded with longshoremen in front and back of me. A great many of them knew of my difficulties and had seen me showing my citizenship papers. Tell the Hawaiian brother to show his citizenship paper. A longshoreman yelled, Stop bothering the poor guy. He's a Native American and he gets treated worse than us aliens. Came from someone else. Show the guy your paper, brother. Another longshoreman yelled. Up and down the gangplank union brothers swore at the guards. The uncomplimentary remarks directed at them brought laughter. The longshoreman had no love for national guardsmen who had been used by employers to shoot and club them and pass strikes. The guard on the ship pointed his rifle at me and I finally got out of line where I was sandwiched by shoving longshoremen. After this incident, if I worked on a ship, I had to wait until all the stevedores had climbed the gangplank. Then a special guard with fixed bay one accompanied me down into the ship's hold where I worked. Several weeks later, I was handling Saks OF plaster on a dock. Someone from behind yanked out my cargo hook which I carried in the back pocket and tore my jeans. I whirled around and saw a National Guard sergeant. What's the matter? I asked. You're under arrest, he said. Then he turned the hook in his hand to indicate that it was a dangerous weapon. This I recalled a few months ago when three FBI agents burst into my home in an early morning raid and rushed into our bedroom. Then they went through our bookshelves and picked up three books from among many and handled them as though they were dangerous items. These books are on library shelves and, like the cargo hook, are sold in the open market. The sergeant of the guard would not let me talk to my foreman. I picked up my jacket and lunch kit. I then noticed a lieutenant and five enlisted men besides the sergeant. The sergeant and a private with a fixed bayonet walked behind me with others in front and on each side. As I was marched off the dock the longshoremen and my gang milled around the state guards and demanded that they examine my papers. Those I had come to know quite well began protesting. Before we were out of the docks a small demonstration was taking place. The FBI, Army and Navy intelligence men questioned me at the ferry building. W. Frey did I leave Hawaii? Why did I go to Georgia? Did I go to the seaport of Savannah? W. T. didn't I? Etc. Etc. Twice the state guards picked me up in the same manner, with so much fanfare that the longshoremen gave them a razzing they deserve. I still kept on working and this annoyed the intelligence agencies. There were two of us Japanese Americans working on the San Francisco docks. One day we were called to the waterfront employer's office and told that the army did not want us to work on the docks anymore. Some Japanese families were being evacuated by the government from so-called strategic areas. I considered going on the farms as a migratory laborer. About this time my Japanese-American longshoreman friend and I learned that a printer was selling a poster saying, Open Season, Jap Hunting License 60 We went to the print shop and told the owner that this sort of incitement would stir up race riots. Never mind, we don't want the Japs around here, he said, thinking we were Chinese. We went to the daily newspapers in San Francisco and wrote them letters asking them to discourage such activities. Only one newspaper out of many responded, and as I recall it was the Daily People's World, whose editors are today on trial under Smith Act indictment for advocating and teaching the overthrow of government by force and violence. The free press was then doing a damnable job. The Hearst newspapers were leading the assault against people of Japanese ancestry. Japanese American loyalty was ripped to shreds and painted black as night. Rumors of downed Japanese airmen in Honolulu wearing rings of West Coast universities, Japanese American sabotage, and other groundless information were printed as facts day after day, even after government authorities, who conducted an investigation, denied such acts. Japanese toy weapons were photographed and printed in West Coast newspapers as actual weapons. In the whipped-up war feeling, Japanese Americans became scapegoats. The anti-Oriental press on the West Coast really went to town and they played a large role in creating the sentiment to oust us from the Western states. These newspapers showed Japanese in horn-rimmed glasses and with buck teeth. This was propaganda to create hatred for all Japanese. The meaning of Japanese imperialism, the thought control of people in Japan, the persecution of communists, trade unionists, and liberals in order to stifle criticism of the policy of foreign aggression, the feudalism of the countryside that made the peasants serfs of the landlords, these were not explained to the American people. 
the newspapers and radio propagandized that all Japanese were treacherous. War feeling created through such information was unhealthy. Americans should have been informed about the basic reasons for Japanese aggression and who profited from it, and told to fight them, not the Japanese people in general because of their alleged inherent treachery or their horn-rimmed glasses and buck teeth. With time, I was to learn that the war had different meanings for various people. For the white supremacists and western imperialists, the early Japanese victories were a terrific loss of prestige for the white man. For a west coast racists invested economic interests. It meant the opportunity tied to wrest cherished properties from Japanese aliens and their children accumulated through many years of toil. By banishing these people inland for the workers and democratic-minded people, it meant the struggle to defeat fascism at home and abroad, to defeat imperialism and help win freedom for colonial people. 